Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, great uh, thesis theater in front of us uh, this afternoon. So Patrick um, has been working on a, an edition of the Old English Rhyming Poem, which is a crazy hard poem, by the way, for anybody who even knows Old English well. Every line is difficult, and he had the audacity and the bravery to tackle this extremely difficult poem. So I will let you take it away. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna pop open my slideshow here and get started. Um, so yeah, thank you. I, uh, um, I, I decided uh, rather foolishly uh, perhaps to try to tackle what turned out to be a rather extraordinarily difficult old English poem, but I, I think I made some uh, some serious headway into it here. Uh, my thesis title is Merry Old Englyn, the familiar and the strange in the old English rhyming poem. Uh, the meaning of that particular title, uh, I hope you will understand as we go along here. But um, my abstract basically is this. Um, the old English rhyming poem is certainly one of the strangest entries in the corpus of old English poetry. And a lot of the previous critical sort of analyses have focused a lot on the inspiration for the poem and have attempted to make sense of well, a very, very complex and convoluted grammar and syntax that we'll see in the poem. Uh, specifically, what I'm doing in this thesis is I am taking a look at three related issues and trying to tackle them. Uh, one, the poem's origin, two, its translation, of course, and three, perhaps even more complex, its interpretation um, based upon the translation. Uh, on point one, I have uh, a new argument for the origin of the poem that I haven't seen any other critical approach taking. Um, I have a new translation on point two as well, of course, and on point three, uh, I'm making the case that treating the poem as a riddle, in addition to an elegy, can perhaps make a greater sense of some of the more complex passages that earlier critics have found most particularly vexing. Uh, the poem itself is, of course, a work of just unparalleled structure in the history of Old English poetry. Um, while its content has been criticized for being incoherent or even inane sometimes, the structural complexity is something that is not replicated anywhere else in all the poetry of the language. The difficulty of the language of the poem itself has meant that it's never really been counted among the greatest works of Old English poetry, as critics have consistently judged that the poem, though it's structurally interesting, is of little poetic or literary value. But my thesis is that at least that last assessment is incorrect. Although it might not belong in the ranks of poems like Beowulf or The Wanderer, the rhyming poem has a lot more nuance and a much defter linguistic touch than at least its early critics ever gave it credit for. Um, so in addition to presenting a different angle on the structural complexity of the poem, I'm going to present a new translation and an argument for a different interpretation of the poem. But in terms of its origins, the first question, while only sparse details survive on Leofric of Exeter, what little data there is on him does suggest that he was a man of both ambition and a forceful character, or at the very least, a man with influential friends, which will do just as well in a pinch. He was appointed as Bishop of Crediton in 1046 and successfully petitioned to have the Episcopal See transferred to in 1050 in a ceremony where the king and queen were actually present. The transfer was granted on the grounds that Crediton was a small town without walls 
close to the sea, and thus it was more prone to attack from seafaring invaders and marauders. Exeter, on the other hand, had walls, uh, a large church, and an ample collection of important relics. The fact that it was seven miles closer to the sea than Crediton and had already been sacked multiple times by invaders seems to have slipped Leofridge's mind. But in either case, he successfully petitioned for the transfer and thereby officially became the first Bishop of Exeter in 1050. But there were really only three reasons that Bishop Leofrich is of any historical significance in the first place. The first is, of course, his primacy as the Bishop of Exeter. The second is that despite the fact that he lived through the reigns of Edward the Confessor and Harold Godwinson and into the reign of William the Conqueror, he survived all the tumult of the Norman conquest and William's purge of English bishops in 1070 with his mitre still on his head. And equally impressively, his head still on his shoulders. All of this, I think, would seem to confirm that he could add a verse to the old song, for like the Vicar of Bray, whatsoever king might reign, he'd be the Bishop of Exeter. But as intriguing as these accomplishments might be, it is his third achievement that his historical significance depends upon, I think, at least for this. Because when he took over at Exeter, he found a library comprising a grand total of five books. But over the course of his time, he supplemented that number by additions from the former Crediton Cathedral, contributions from his own personal library, and by commissioning copies made of other books. He ensured that the library by the time he died had about 60 books in it, including which was one described as Mitchell English book by Yehwilkum Thingum on Leoth Wisan Yewart, which is a large English book about many things worked in verse. This is the compendium that would become known as the Exeter book. How the book came into his possession is unclear. Uh, the best estimates suggest that the manuscript itself was actually written about a century before his time during the English Benedictine revival from 960 to 980. Uh, even this late 10th century creation though was probably a copy of an earlier collection from the beginning of the century. Um, indications seem to be that the material that's actually compiled in this book was composed over the span of about 200 years before the original compilation date as well. As well. Uh, but the usage of rhyme as a poetic vehicle in the rhyming poem and the diversity of dialectical forms that are used in it suggest a later date of composition within that range, probably sometime during the reign of Alfred or one of his immediate successors in the late 9th or early 10th century. But in spite of the fact that rhyme was not exactly natural to the language at this stage of Old English, there are more than simply a handful of examples of its usage in Old English meter. It appears, in fact, in what is debatably the earliest Old English poem, which is Cadman's Hymn. Here, there's a distinct possibility that it's just an accident, but it does happen that uh, the third to last line here, tha mid an yard mon kun is ward, does actually rhyme. Whether it's accidental or not is unclear. I mean, once you get to a certain number of lines, a couple of them probably are going to rhyme anyway. But there are subsequent examples in other poetic works that are far more certain. A very, a more definitive example anyway, can be found in Maxims 1, also of the Exeter book, that has these lines in it, where you see, you know, holen shal in alid, urve yedalid, yachnigan yasigan, genge lenge, yehalden yualden, that these are much clearer examples of deliberate rhyme going on here. But even these examples are still fairly limited and are contained to one or two lines, of course. 
Um, a handful of poems toward the end of the Old English period have signs of implying rhyme a bit more frequently, such as, uh, well, Riddle 29, actually, also of the Exeter book, where we get these lines. Torven, swarven, curid, thurid, bunden, wunden, blatched, watched, pratwed, yatwed, quikra, wichta, klenget, lenget. Right? Uh, which is, of course, very, very sing-songy and very clearly deliberately rhyming. But despite the variety of examples of these flourishes of Old English rhyming poetry, none of these examples actually show a direct precedent for the level of complexity in rhyme displayed by the rhyming poem. Uh, there is one source that does bear a closer resemblance to the structure adopted by the poet of the rhyming poem, and those lines are the lines near the conclusion of Kinewolf's Elenae, where we get this. So we get Frodenfus, Fachnehus, Wav, Laz, Freududa, Reododa, Narwe, Yarwe, Rich, the Athat, right? Onrea, Fa, Asalid, Yoalid, that the, a whole sequence of rhyming lines here that are not just clipped together. This is one fluid sequence at the end of LNA. Um, at the length of 15 lines, despite the occasional stumbles, it is far and away the longest of these rhyme experiments in Old English outside the rhyming poem itself. Some critics have even argued that the selection of Elena served as the precedent and perhaps the inspiration for the poet of the rhyming poem in the first place. Uh, this section is apparently used for emotional intensity in Elena and may well have been used by the poet of the rhyming poem to lend this emotional intensity to an entire distinct poem. However, the lines here, as we're going to see, are a little bit different because uh, the lines are just couplets here, essentially, that each rhyme only comes in pairs, which will be significant as we come uh, along a little bit later here. Even the passage from LNA does tail in comparison to the rhyme scheme of the rhyming poem, and I don't think can be established as the sole inspiration for it, although it may well have played a role. For one thing, the most sustained example of rhyme outside Kinewolf and the rhyming poem managed five sequential half lines, and that was Riddle 29. While Kinewolf stretched this number to 30, of course, in that previous passage, the rhyming poem manages a virtually uninterrupted chain of rhymes for the entirety of its 173 half lines. The larger objection beyond the simple difference in length is that the rhyme scheme of the rhyming poem is unique even among the select ranks of rhymes in Old English. While every other example of rhyme was content to limit the rhyme to a couplet, as I was saying, just two rhymes, the basic rhyming unit of the rhyming poem is a sort of quatrain. Almost every rhyme introduced is replicated across four sequential half lines. And at one point it stretches even to 17 which is, of course, a scheme that is not replicated anywhere else in Old English. But when it comes to the rhyming poem, its rhyme scheme is hardly the only thing making it unique, given the fact that the poem predates the full shift to standard rhyming poetry by at least three centuries in English. The author seems to have regarded it as kind of trivial to simply create a poem that rhymed, as with the other examples above, in addition to the rhyming meter, the poem also meets all of the expectations of alliterative poetry as well. All the other instances of rhyme used it as a sort of decoration, but in this poem, it's being treated as having an equivalent status with, alliter with alliteration, and neither the rhyme nor alliteration is sacrificed for the sake of the other. These four lines that I have up here are indicative of the overall structure, because we see, well, you can see wongum, gongum, longum, yatongum, and those are the four lines, four rhymes in sequence. But each one of these lines also has the full complement of alliteration. Uh, the three Ws here, which wongum, wenan, lisa, longum, leoma, there as well. 
while the rule of alliterative poetry in Old English only requires one alliterating stress in the first half line, the rhyming poet maintains the full complement of two alliterative stresses in the first half line for pretty much the entire poem. Furthermore, um, the poem's usage of assonance and pararime, even beyond this extremely difficult and intricate poetic structure is rather curious on its own as well. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But if the kaleidoscope of poetic types that was structuring the rhyming poem was not enough to make the poem a compelling study, it would, I think, be worthwhile, at least for the colorful history of the critical approaches to the text in the first place. The abortive attempts to translate it tell an interesting tale of their own, but the sheer consternation that the poem has caused its critics makes for some of the most entertaining research reading that an aspiring academic could possibly hope for. In short, the poem dwells, I think, in a rarefied air, which is rarely, I think, has a text ever received such a pompous plastering of such exquisitely elegant vitriol because the first serious study of the poem was undertaken by Reverend John Josias Coney Bear as he published a brief commentary on it in 1814 and a more complete one in 1826. Coney Bear's work, in addition to being the first serious study of the poem, also unfortunately set two rather dubious precedents for at least a century to come. The first was the uninspired title, of course, which unfortunately stuck, the rhyming poem. The second was at least more entertaining as Tony Bear's commentary became only the first of many critiques cushioned by a thousand feathers of formal disdain, commenting personally that the poet bound by the double fetters of alliteration and rhyme has found himself obliged to sacrifice sense to sound to a more than ordinary extent, and that every letter almost is hampered by the absurd intricacy of the meter. He explained as well that the poem presented such problems of interpretation that the incomplete translation ultimately ended up being loose and conjectural. While Coney Bear broke a great deal of new ground, the translation published in 1826 was of course, both incomplete and self-professedly imprecise. The next serious attempt at dealing with the problems of the poem came in 1838. Despite the abrupt and broken style of the poem, which is made up as it were of shreds and patches, Edwin Guest managed a much more comprehensive translation than Coney Bear had and translated virtually the entire poem with a handful of elisions. In 1842, Thorpe found himself disastrously routed by the poem, admitting finally with a slight trace of bitterness that this poem I do not understand and am therefore unable to translate. It seems to me that the final words are in numerous instances altered from their true orthography for the purpose of forming a rhyme and that it is by no means void of blunders. In 1880, Sidney Lanier published a slightly revised and expanded version of Coney Bear's original translation, but admitted to the abundance of guesswork involved in its translation. It was really only in 1922, nearly a hundred years after the first attempt, that a satisfactory rendering into English finally came to light in the work of W.S. Mackey. Fortunately, or at least entertainingly, his work also improved upon Coney Bear's in both significant aspects. His translation was more accurate and his academic snark was far more polished. As he says, it is clear that the rhymed poem is quite an appropriate title for the elegy. The rhymes are the author's chief interest and he riots in them in a super Swinburnian manner. He chooses a complex metrical scheme and then fails to fit the expression of his ideas easily and naturally into it. He is intent upon a jingle and careless of sense. 
Almost anything will do into which an approximately suitable meaning may be read or forced. Fortunately for the purposes of idle entertainment, if nothing else, Mackey's commentary was only one of many examples of such an approach to the text. Charles F. Richardson, for example, in response to Thorpe's remark about being unable to translate it, dryly commented that it is not worth the trouble. Richardson, I think, would know, as he does not seem to have troubled himself with trying to translate it. Other critics have been slightly more reserved, commenting that the poem rhymes extensively, if crudely, and some have been far more direct, saying that it is inferior poems, such as the rhymed poem, that give much trouble to a translator, since it is difficult to give a sensible rendering of lines or passages that can never have been anything but incoherent babbling. The invective continued even into the writings of more modern critics with Derek Parasol calling the poem a lunatic exercise and Edward Irving, less eloquently, a piece of trash. The true pinnacle of this critical approach though can be seen in the work of W.J. Sedgefield whose commentary on one line encapsulates his opinion of the entire poem, quote, a nonsense line, a veritable rhyme orgy. Sed Sedgefield's uh, rhyme orgies aside, later scholarship on the poem gradually began to note its literary merit, particularly as translations began to cope better with the thornier passages of the poem. Even in the time of Sedgefield and Mackey, there were those who took a more favorable stance on the poem, and in the century since, academic criticism has become much more receptive to the merits of the work. Cross uh, here praised the poem for the connection it establishes between the life of man and the life of the world, culminating in the corruption of old age, combined with literary imagery of a worldly apocalypse. Greenfield also commented on the structure of the poem and argued that the complex poetic scheme was actually appropriately allied to the themes of the work. One critic uh, made a very comprehensive analysis of the poem based on the numerical symmetry, punctuation, rhyme scheme, hypermetrical lines and sense, and commented himself that by ignoring the first four criteria, some scholars have misunderstood the fifth. And finally, the last one I have here, the resulting work deserves a better reputation than it has generally enjoyed in the past. It informs an impressive part of the elegiac tradition in Old English poetry. When it comes to the actual search for the sources and inspirations for the poem, the oldest of these theories comes from Coney Bear himself. His commentary reflects on the potential connection with skaldic poetry of the ninth century, which could have been known to an Anglo-Saxon poet of the time. Uh, Coney Beer particularly points to the Runhenda type of poetry, which can rhyme and alliterate in a similar way to that of the Old English poem, as I have here. Uh, this type of poetry does seem to bear a strong resemblance to the structure of the rhyming poem, and Coney Beer's theory was accepted and repeated by several others, who compared it to the Icelandic poem Hofuflausen, specifically. But even at this early stage, critics questioned the association and suggested different sources for the poetic scheme. Edwin Guest, again, uh, followed Coney Beer to some degree, but also pointed out that there is every reason to believe these rhythms of native growth. Guest's caution proved to be well-founded as the weight of later critical opinion would eventually attest. Sedgefield suggested that instead of a skaldic connection, the familiar rhyming Latin hymns may have prompted ecclesiastical writers of Anglo-Saxon verse to imitation. James W. Earle later explained that the closest relative to the structure of the rhyming poem was not Old Norse, but Hiberno-Latin hymnody, which was probably the same influence that later resulted in Runhenda. For his part, Earle pointed to the complex interaction between Latin and Old English poetry, in which alliterative poetic concepts transferred over into the rhyming poetry of Latin, producing verses such as this. And here, um, has a triple alliteration in lines one and two, uh, and just like the rhyming poem, each line has an end rhyme that rhymes with the word before the medial 
uh, Thetura. But as impactful as Latin poetry undoubtedly was on the origins of the rhyming poem, even the Latin doesn't tell the entire story. For one thing, even the closest parallel in the Sancta Sator poem above does not actually match the poetic structure. The lines immediately following those quoted are the ones below here. It does consistently maintain the rhyme within each line with freta, freta, kelox, velox, numen, lumen, arche, parche, etc. But while it does show an interest in adapting, adapting an Old English style of alliteration into this type of rhyming poetry, it doesn't achieve it universally or consistently. The et piacla dira yacla does not alliterate at all, and quia plusta ferunt fustra does so in a way that would break the rules of Old English poetry. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the first two lines and the last four lines of this poem are the only ones that actually carry the rhyme across four sequential half lines in the Latin, as the Old English poem does throughout. The central mode of this Latin poem is primarily that of alliteration and rhyme within the individual line and not beyond it, as the Old English rhyming poem does. While these principles of Latin poetry undoubtedly had a significant impact on the development of rhyming poetry in English generally, and to some degree, the rhyming poem in particular, one of the most intriguing possibilities for structural inspiration that few, if any, critics have ever touched upon is actually Welsh poetry. The particular Welsh poetic style that is involved here is what is known as King Haneth. King Haneth is a system of rhyme and alliteration that forms the basis for various different subtypes of Welsh poetry. The principles of Welsh poetry became much more formalized in the 15th century, but the origins of King Haneth go all the way back to the 5th century, which offers ample opportunity for the coexistence of certain types of this poetry at the same time as the rhyming poem. King Haneth, like Old English poetry, is based around a poetic structure that ties a poem together by connecting words across line divisions. But in King Haneth, this connection has to do with pararhyme structure that uses the repetition of the same consonant pattern before and after the line break, which you can see here in the Welsh examples on top. You get uh, in red here, LRC, LRC, you know, BR, DR, DR, BR, DR, DR. You know, and you know, this last one, but I'm not going to try to pronounce Welsh. I'm sorry, it's uh, one of my many failings. But this particular structure is replicated frequently in the rhyming poem. A handful of examples that I've pulled out here. Lissa bleum blost mahiwum, lissa lengdon, lustum lengdon. Preo telgada, tiru elgada, lustum lineth, lustum nitineth. That the same sort of pararhyme is going on here. In addition to the pararhyme parallel, however, the more significant correspondence between this Welsh poetry and the rhyming poem is that several types of King Haneth also use rhyme. A subtype called Englyn uses a sequence of four rhyming lines, in some examples anyway, just as the rhyming poem does. Here's one example of a four-line rhyming King Haneth. And furthermore, within the Englinion, there is flexibility for one or two of the four lines to only half rhyme. That is, the final vowel or the final consonant matches the others, but not both. So here we have three rhymes, but the first one, amser, er, is only a half rhyme. It replicates the final e, but not the final consonant. This half rhyming convention found in Welsh poetry actually could explain some of the enigmatic deviations within the poem that critics have pointed out in the past as metrical stumbles, where one half line fails to rhyme or a couplet does not rhyme between the lines. There are a couple of examples here. Yateo, Stald, and Fichte and Mahin at the bottom here don't technically rhyme, but they do half rhyme within this you know, fourfold grouping here. The potential impact of Welsh on the rhyming poem is also supported by one prevailing theory around the poem's composition. Uh, the poem 
is supposedly a West Saxon translation of an Anglian original. And as such, the impact of Welsh poetry would be easy enough to explain, as Wales is just to the west of the area in which the Anglian dialect would have been most prevalent. And it would not be too much of a leap to imagine poetic inspiration crossing the borders between the two regions, particularly for a poet who seemed to have no problem with borrowing dialect forms from different areas or poetic precedents from different languages. Now, for the actual poem, which is my favorite part. You'll have to indulge me because I will take any opportunity to read Old English, but I will disguise this under the excuse that the rhythm and sound of this poem is powerful and almost hypnotic, even if you might not exactly understand what it means. So here we go. May leave us on la, say this leoch on ra, on that torch de yeteo tiliche on ra. Glad was it gleevum, gleng had he wum, bliss ableum blost mahivum, sech as mech sehon, symbol ne alehon, fair heave a ye fehon, frat wed wagon, witch over wongum, wen on gongum, lis amid longum leoma yeton. Tha was wast mum awacht, world on sprecht, under rodrum aracht, rad mine over that. Yes, das yengdon, yer ship a mengdon, lis a lengdon, lustum glengdon. Shreven shrad glad thur ye shad in brad, was on la who stram a lad, far me leothu ne be glad. Have the itch han a had, ne was me in halagad. That's their rough wear to rod, oft their rinch ye bad. That hagen sell a sigh a cinch ye wire, denum ye fichte, thendin was ich mayen. Horsham ek heridon, hilde ye neridon, fire a feridon, feondon de weridon. Swa, nek hit ye vu hailed, he a drift the failed, stathalachtum styled, step the gongum wailed. Swilch earth all, acht each alder stall, galdor wardum gol, gomel sibene of all, aquas ye fest yar, yellend the snare, wunni and o war, will beck the shar, shalkas were and sharper, shill was harper, plude linede, pleo for dunede, sway o rad swinsada, swift and a minsada, burch sell a beofoda, beort lifade. Ellen Achnada, Erd Bachnada, Freon Frodada, Fromum Godada. Maud Maynada, Minna Feynada, Freo Telgada, Tier Welgada. Blad Blissade, Gold Yarwade, Yim Huerfade, Sinch Serwade, Sib Narwade, From it was in Fratum, Freolich in Yatwum, Was mind Rand Richtlich, Rotha Hitch Hitlich. Fold on its freothoda, fulcum its leothoda. Leaf was min longer, leom, leodum in your monger. Tirum your tonga, tala your hunger. Nu min hrethor is hreo, heo sithum sheo, nid bizium na. You eat the thnithas in flare. Say ar in dire was dearer. Shreetheth no dear fear. Brontord ye blowen, breostum for growen, flüchtum to flowen, pla is ye blowen, michlum in ye minde, modes ye kinde, greteth ungrinde, groan even binde, balofus burneth, bitre to earneth, where it winneth, widsith on ginneth, sarne sinneth, sorhum kinneth, blad his blinneth, bliss a linneth, lustum linneth, listum linneth, lustum netineth. Drama swa her ye dreosa, richt ship a ye chreosa. Lif her men for leosa, lacht tres off ye cheosa. Treo thrag his to trag, seo on trume ye chnag. Stapum atole mista, on al stund ye chnag. Swa nu world wendeth, weird descendeth, on het es henteth, halas es shinteth. When kin ye witteth, walgar sliteth. Flach ma fleeteth, flan mon wheateth. Burksword beateth, bald ald sweeteth, rack fac wreatheth, rafath smeeteth. 
Sin grin sida sacrifaro glideth, Grom ton graveth grast hava. Staro quit sola, sumor hat cola, Fold wala fairleth, Beon chip awaleth, Eorth my an aldeth, Ellen cola, Meth at weird ye waf on ye quirth for gaf. That each grove a graf on that grim a graf, Flan flashen am I, Bon flan red die, Nud grapum nimeth, Bon seo nacht bekimeth. Seo me ethles on von, on mech her her des on con. Thona licho me lieth, lim a wyrm friteth. Ach him wenna ye wigeth, on ta wist ye thigeth. Oth that beoth the ban an, on the at nichstan nan, nefne se nedatan, palawun her ye hlotene, ne bith sa chlisa adroren. Ar that adig ye thinketh, he hina the oth or swenketh. Byrieth him the bitran sinna, hogath to thar a betran winna. Ymon mortha lissa, her sindon milt sa blissa, kicht liche in heovano riche. Utan nuhalium ye liche, shildum beshiride, shindan ye nerede, womum beverde, wuldre ye nerede. Thar monkin mot for meo toda rot, soth ne god ye seon, and aa in sipa ye fan. And for, admittedly, my much less poetic English translation, modern English. To me, he granted life who revealed this light. And that bright matter he kindly revealed. Glad was I with glee, adorned with form, with the colors of joy, with the hue of a blossom. Men saw me, banquets did not fail. For my life-giving, they rejoiced. Moved me adorned horses over fields with joy in their journeys, in delight with long strides of limbs. Then with fruits the world was awakened, the world blossomed, spread out under the skies, overcovered with might counsel. Guests came, mingled merriment, longed for my grace, adorned with joy. The ordained ship glided, clove through the waves into the broad sea. A path was upon the sea stream where my ship did not abandon me. I had a high rank, nor was there any lack for me in the hall, so that there a valiant troop rode. Oft there a man abode so that he in the hall might see pleasure-bearing good thy thanes. While I was mighty, sharp men praised me, protected in battle, fairly bore me, from fiends protected me. So the joy gift held me, my soul troop enfolded me, I held the heavens for counsel. I wielded over men's goings as earth produced. I had an elder seat, sang with charm words. As an old man, I did not produce a kinship. But a good year was most giving. A string singing, abiding faith sheared the wild brook. The servants were sharp, resounding was the harp. Loudly sounded, the song dinned, the sky rode chorused and lessened but little. The burg hall trembled, bright light towered up, valor increased, riches beckoned. With lords I was wise, with the strong I was good, spirit strengthened, mind rejoiced, troth flourished, glory abounded, prosperity gladdened, gold supplied, the gem turned about, treasure betrayed, kinship narrowed. Firm I was in my adornments, noble in trappings, my joy was lordly, my life hopeful. The fold I protected, I sang for the folk. My life was long among the people, close to glory, rightly inclined. Now my soul is disturbed. Fearful for my adventures of fortune, close to distress. He departs in flight by night, who before in day was dear. Deep fire glides now, a blossomed brand hoard, overgrown in my breast, flown away in flight. A moat is blossomed greatly in the mind. Endless sorrow attacks my mind's nature, even penned. Bale ready it burns, bitterly rushes about, weary it strives, begins a far venture. Pain does not cease, but grows in sorrows. His fame ceases, joy departs leaves from his craft, endures not in his joys. 
So here his joys fall into decay. Lordship falls apart. Life here men utterly lose and oft choose vices. Troth time is too wicked. It bowed sickly. It failed in that terrible towering time and continually declined. So now the world wends. It sends weird and seizes on hatred, speeds to a warrior. Happiness passes away. Slaughter spear slits. The deceitful and wicked one strives. Crime wets the arrow. Pledge sorrow bites. Age cuts off the bold. Vengeance time twists. The angry oath smites. The crime ground widens. The path of the hateful glides. Grim rage engraves, a carving has. Crafted whiteness grows foul, just as summer heat cools. The fold wealth falls, fiendship wells, earth might ages, valor cools. Weird wove that for me and gave a turning so that I dug a grave. And that grim hollow I cannot flee with my flesh when the arrow swift day takes me with a distress grasp. Then comes the night that takes me from my homeland and here accuses me of hard things. Then the body hame lies, worm gnaws the limbs, but carries joy in him, and they take the feast until the bones are one, and at last none. Unless that necessity is here by evil lot, that fame is unfallen. Before the happy one thinks that, he distresses himself the oftener and buries for himself the bitter sins, resolves upon the better joys, remembers the mercies of deaths. Here are the joys of mildness, pleasantly in the kingdom of heavens. Let us now, like the holy ones, be sheared of sins, hurry, delivered, defended from corruption, delivered in glory, where man kin can, joyful before the measurer, see the true God, and ever in his kinship rejoice. Disagreements over the merits of the poem are, well, far from settled, but perhaps a more curious part of the peculiar history of the critical reception of the poem has to do with the confusion over what would ordinarily seem to be a rather simple question. What is it about? Part of the reason that this is even a question in the first place is due to the demands on the language presented by the complex meter. The poet uses a substantial dose of hapaxes and nonce words throughout, and it is because of the conjecture around the meanings of these words that some of the confusion around the subject arises. Tony Beer concluded that it was an illustration of the transitory nature of human enjoyments. Edwin Guest commented on the curiosity of the unidentified central character, speaking in the first person for much of the poem, calling him a minstrel king based upon his reading of the poem. Thorpe uh, noted its similarity to the suffering of the central character in chapters 29 and 30 of the book of Job. Mackey, also commenting on the difficulty of the obscure and strangely allegorical language, hazarded to say that this character was suffering from a cancer in the later part of the poem when his fortunes are fading. Lehman took a different tack entirely, suggesting that the poem was just as much one of the Exeter riddles as anything else and offered the possibility that the strange descriptions of the character's appearance might rather be a depiction of something general, like the will of God. Cross also commented on the more abstract nature of the poem, praising it for the union of imagery it produces between personal life and death and worldly creation and apocalypse. There is general agreement that the poem has a three-part structure loosely broken into a joyful time from line one to 42, affliction and old age from 43 to 79a, 
and then an abrupt turn to heavenly consolation from 79b to 87, which mirrors the opening lines of the poem. But there's still strangely little agreement on the central character. Whether or not Lehman is ultimately correct in associating the rhyming poem with a riddle, though, the suggestion itself opens the door to a fascinating set of possibilities as to what the poem might actually be about. Lehman suggested the will of God cross the life and death of the world, but I personally would suggest a third alternative. A tree. The opening of the poem calls to mind nature and creation, even as it seems to also describe the life of an individual Lord. Polysemantic words you know, with multiple meanings are used extensively throughout, and these terms are almost universally open to a tree interpretation. Blostma and wastmum, while perhaps not exclusive to trees, are at very least frequently associated with them and would be expected in a tree's surroundings. Leoma is another word that serves double duty, as it can mean either the limb of an animal or the limb of a tree. Freo Telgada works as faith flourished, but also as the tree flourished, and is immediately followed by Blad Blissede, in which the word Blad can mean either prosperity or leaf, as of a tree. Gold Yarwada follows this motif for a third sequential line, as Yarwian can mean supply, as of treasure, or come to maturity, as of a plant or a tree. Line 57 continues this correspondence with Freyo Frag is to Frag, Seo on Truma While it could be speaking of oaths, it could also mean the tree season is too wicked. It bowed sickly. So too with the usage of Yabloen, blossomed, in 46, another very naturalistic word. Lima, as Leoma before, also admits of either sort of limb being referenced. One of the reasons this idea of the character being a tree is so tenacious is that aside from what can be seen as the more direct references, the tree consideration sheds light on a number of the more enigmatic passages in the poem. The nature imagery throughout the poem fits nicely with tree association, but more indicative are the passages in which the speaking character being a tree make more sense than they would if they were taken in reference to the unnamed Lord in his hall. For one thing, Theridon is never used anywhere else to describe the support of a leader by his retainers, but is usually done with the sense of literal carrying. The metaphorical sense of the word would be unprecedented, but the literal sense would be nonsensical. Warriors carrying their leader into battle would be similarly unprecedented. But there is something that men going into battle would be physically carrying. Which is from Beowulf, but uh, their ineffectiveness against dragons aside, linden shields are fairly commonly used, at least in descriptions of battles found in Old English sources. The comment about being born into battle then could be speaking of a tree or even a wood and the various ways that such a thing is used in society. Line 15's ne was me and halagad continues this association as there is indeed no lack for wooden things in a hall within or without or in the very structure of the hall itself. Uh, McCray Gibson furthermore has pointing to the unsatisfactory sense yielded by interpreting Swilche Eirtha all in line 23 here as a subordinate clause of comparison, whether related to the preceding or following clause. But here again, the tree analogy works to make sense of the apparent inconsistency, whichever clause it's connected to. If Swilche Eirtha all is a subordinate clause of comparison connected to uh, Steppegongum Weald, a tree does indeed wield over men's goings as a tree hangs over a forest path as earth produced it. If taken with Achte ich Alverstall, an aged tree also has an elder seat as earth produced it. 
Furthermore, even the alternative definition for Aldersal would work in reference to a tree as Aldor can also mean life. A tree anchored by its roots indeed has a metaphorical and literal life seat, which would furthermore work in tandem with the earth producing imagery of 23a. The other naturalistic imagery mentioned in the commentary tends to reinforce the idea of the tree as well. The swale rod of line 29 likely is a reference to the path of the sun across the sky. The word yim is nominally a reference to treasure, but is strangely singular rather than plural, and in context suggests rather the metaphorical gem of the sun as it turns about in the sky rather than a trove of treasure. Tala yahong of 42 can mean either well inclined or hung well with fruit. Flüchtum as well, like Feridon before, has a primary context that leans more towards nature than it does towards a man, as its potential metaphorical use to describe the progress of a cancer, as Mackey proposed, has far less grounding than the meaning that Flüchtum commonly entails, which is the flight of a bird. In this context, perhaps the birds that have finally flown from the branches of the tree. On the subject of this character's strange, supposedly cancerous illness, while some translate tofloan as meaning to spread, the word actually has a sense of departing and dispersing in that spreading. This compounded in context by flüchtum, which seems to indicate a departure or flight of this internal corruption, the brondhord, leaving the speaker behind, ironically, empty of it. But in the context of a tree, the corruption of a dying tree would involve a slow decay and then a gradual disintegration, leaving the dead husk of the tree hollowed from within. The brond hoard could even be in reference to a literal fire or a bolt of lightning burning out the tree from within. Foldwella, as potentially meaning field wealth, and Eorthmayan, as earth might, are also terms that are at least generically to do with nature and could specifically be referencing a tree or a forest. Tan, while it means lot, comes by that meaning due to its primary context and meaning, which is a twig used in casting lots. Furthermore, the meditation on death and decay in the second half of the poem occasionally employs an abstract grammar to which a tree might provide the answer. The clearest example of this might be uh, 71a to 72a, that itch grove graph on that grim graph, flan flashing am I. A metaphorical interpretation is possible, which would mean something to the effect of, I made my own bed on this one. But the literal interpretation is curiously powerful. A man digging his own grave and meditating on the inevitable death. Of course, how and why this man might, might be digging his own grave are far from clear. And it's a curiosity that a tree can also answer. A dying tree has indeed dug its own grave that it cannot flee with its flesh. Anchored to the earth, the source of its life and the growth of its roots becomes ironically the inescapable grave that it has dug for itself when it finally dies. None of this, of course, serves to definitively prove that a tree is really the subject of the rhyming poem. That possibility exists, and that interpretation poses a solution to some of the strange intricacies and metaphors of the poem that make accurate translation so elusive. It is an interpretation that explains the usage of a number of the polysemantic terms and phrases within the poem, but admittedly not all of them. Even if this interpretation is correct, it may be too limited. Is the subject supposed to be a tree, a forest, the general concept, or a specific tree, or a particular forest? The biblical wastamum, the cinch sarawada, and the wirum gnawing at the limbs could even be some sort of reference to the tree in the Garden of Eden. Or it might not be a tree at all. The poem is, after all, a powerful meditation on life and death, and the connection between the life of one man, the life of mankind, and the life of the natural world itself. And that is enough. <laughs>
It is a vivid description of the transitory joys of life, as well as the inevitability of death, and the consolation that can ultimately be found in those final moments. What this thesis ultimately has aimed to show is that Whatever the poem's missteps may be, there is a great deal more going on in it than most of its early critics ever gave it credit for. Even if this is only about the life and death of the Lord, it is a powerfully rendered composition for all that, from its theme to its intricate usage of polysemantic language to its metrically astounding poetic structure to its abundant use of grammatical, literary, and poetic conventions from other dialects and diverse languages. But I do take comfort in the fact that this is hardly a far-fetched theory. It would not be the first time, after all, that an Old English poem was written from the perspective of a sentient tree. But even if it is nothing else, it is a potent poetic testament to the sorts of concerns that are at the forefront of the best poems in the language. It may be a riddle, it may be an elegy, it may be a rhyme orgy, but it is a unique poetic work by any definition and ends with both the bleakness and the consolation that is the particular purview of the best of Old English poems. Eovon Regeswalg. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. That was amazing. And by the way, we loved the recitation of the poem. I think that was Thank you. <laughs> absolutely wonderful to hear. Like, oh my God, you're so good at pronouncing Old English. I think we should just basically sign you up to record every single text that's ever been written. <laughs> like all of our texts for every course that we have, we'd love to have it. Um, but yeah, I, it, <laughs> that'd be that'd be super cool. And um, the, I should also note that the difficulty of the translation, um, that's sort of what's what's lost in revealing your translation is each and every line is open to many interpretations and this was sort of sound reasoning and kind of best guessing at, in other cases. Um, and, and we know that, uh, but that's sort of not, it's not clear when you're like, oh yeah, this is what the, the translation is. I just want to make that clear for the record that this is a best guess based on ex like overthinking each and every line because we have to, because so many of these are obscure and unknown um, linguistic forms, in addition to like the the variability of semantic nuances that we could have for each and every line. <laughs> so well done, I would say. Um, and I did wanna, wanna open us up to any questions, uh, if we have any comments or questions from our audience. One thing I, I will say as well is that that was, I mean, that I, I have a lot of these alternates in the footnotes, but the, I, I remember that, you know, when we were having our Zoom meetings and just spending hours pounding our heads against mm -hmm. various different lines, you know, including, of course, like 24 to 25, which, you know, I still, I, I was just, I, well, your suggestion at the end saved me a little bit there. So was, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's also, there's sort of a difficulty of the dialectal layers. You did mention it. So e the fact that we have a copy of a lost original, as best we can tell, also gives us another coloring. That sounds familiar to pretty much every Old English poem, especially some famous ones. Um, dialectal interference that we have some forms that seem to be Kentish and Anglian, and yet we're here in West, West Saxon again. And the difficulties that each word presents, the spelling variation. I will say I did share a link to the manuscript if anybody wants to check it out. It's extremely easy to read the Exeter book. I mean, this is like one of the finest manuscripts around, very beautiful and well-preserved. That doesn't make the poem any easier, <laughs> as we know. Um, it, it, but it's, I think the difficulty is 
it, you know, beyond the translation is then also just noting how beautiful this poem is and that the, you know, veritable rhyme orgy aside, that, that harsh criticism, I mean, there's something to this poem that you can sense the mood shift and the mood shifts, I think, in the plural happening. Um, you know, we kind of have, uh, so even if the focus were the rhyme itself for the composer, whoever that may have been, they also seem to, they have a, they have a, several themes that they're, they're, they're encoding here, um, kind of buried in the text in a sense, because they buried it in the most intricate old English poem in existence. I mean, this is the, the creme de la creme of complexity. Um, you know, this is something that you did note that it's, it's officially kind of been dismissed as being related to skaldic poetry, but I will say that in the old Germanic sphere, this is the closest we get to that level of complexity in old English poetry. Not to say that there aren't other difficulties in, in other old English poems, but this is bordering on the level of skaldic difficulty. In fact, in some ways more difficult. Um, so very well done. That's that's what I wanted to say. And congratulations on completing this. I hope that this is a that this becomes a a, a published work. You know, in very similar format to the way that it stands now. It's extremely well written. Um, you know, the your addition also on top of that. I mean, that's a valuable contribution. Um, the the translation and extensive endnotes, by the way, like half of the text is just detailed endnotes on, on each and every line. And that's, that's again, the difficulty of, of taking on a, a, um, in a, a, not a poem that shouldn't be obscure, but is relegated to obscurity. I mean, it's from the, one of the best known collections of old English poetry in manuscripts. So, There was, yeah, there's something in the Q and A here. Is this the, oh yeah, from Rob. Um, yeah, the, the unpaired half line was um, a, uh, that was one that um, it is, yeah, it's it's just missing the, the complimentary half line in the manuscript. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's one of those things where it's, it's very unclear. Uh, I mean, it, it's probably something that's lost in a transcription, um, but it's one, it's it's nestled right in the middle of like a long list of, uh, what do you call it? Um, like uh, hypotactical uh, phrases where they're all just sort of piling up and building up to something. So it's like one lost phrase in there. And so the the sentence structure doesn't actually suffer for not having the missing phrase. But also, it could very easily have been dropped out accidentally. So there probably was something there originally. Um, and there are various different editions hypothesized as to what goes in there, but it's a different hypothesis for every different edition. So that's, uh, that's generally what it is. to flow and yeah um i mean it's like essentially flowing out in flights right oh you want to go huh. sorry is there a oh no i, I was, was just trying to figure out the the, the signals yeah, <laughs> the little signals in the q and a here so yeah could flicht on into flowing in line 47 possibly point to birds spreading seeds from the tree cool i mean that's I suppose that's a possibility. I, I hadn't really thought about that, right? Because we have the tree that's dying and there's the corruption of the tree. And it's, I mean, if, if it is a tree again, like it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be a tree, but uh, you know, the flichtum, the flowing out in flights that is very reminiscent of birds. Um, so I suppose it could be hypothetically sort of the beginning of that new life aspect that where we get the turn at the end, right? The death of the tree, and then there's, you know, a sapling or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, 
within the context of the poem, it seems to be talking about the corruption itself, the brawn toward. Um, but I mean, again, there, there are so many parts of this poem that are, uh, where the context is just so difficult to determine. Uh, one of the things that I did in my edition was <laughs> essentially just went, you know, to hell with it. I'm not going to put any punctuation in here because there isn't any punctuation in the manuscript. And like the, the insertion of punctuation artificially shapes particularly this poem, since it's clearly very deliberately trying to play with the various different meanings that each line can have and the various different things that it can be connected to. And so putting a period or a semicolon or a comma somewhere can artificially skew things sometimes. But of course, when you're making your translation, you do have to make those sorts of decisions. <laughs> So I I feel like you have mastered this insanely complicated poem, and I'm I was honored to to uh, supervise this thesis. So yeah, definitely Master Patrick. I think <laughs> is your new title. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This I I would not. <laughs> there's no way I would have gotten through this without you. Uh, glad glad to help. It's my pleasure, truly. So I think that we're ready to wrap things up. And with that, I'd like to say congratulations and uh, thank you. So thank you all for attending. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.